Welcome, John Kovac Jr. to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? Doing well. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Michael. Of course. And I'm so happy you can make it on today, have you on as a motivational speaker. And I know the term motivational speaker is something that's very common, but the work that you do is so much more than that. And I want people to understand the work you do and how you help people. In your own words, can you please tell the world who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. The term motivational speaker, it's like saying I do real estate, right? You know, there's so much more to unpack than what meets the eye. So at a very young age, I found my voice. I found my power. I found how I could help the wallflowers get off of the wall and feel like themselves so that they could comfortably and have an experience and enjoy themselves. And I realized that was a key principle in what I do. So I didn't call it motivational speaking then. I didn't call it public speaking then. I just called it leadership. I got into clubs and all sorts of different leadership opportunities for myself to just get better at using my voice and curating an environment for success in others. It wasn't until about 2016 is when I picked up my first copy of a book called Think and Grow Rich. And Think and Grow Rich, I was blown away. I couldn't put it down. It was such a good book. And I recognized that these were true principles, not just facts or strategies or tactics on how to you know, develop wealth, but they were principles on creating success for yourself and for the environment around you. And there's one chapter in particular that I found very interesting, and I put it to the test so much that I quit my job over it. I read chapter 10, which is about the mastermind methods. And in the mastermind methods, Napoleon Hill talks about how when you put two minds together, it creates this third mind, basically igniting or eliciting the infinite intelligence of the universe and allowing you to dive into or create solutions for one another. The only requirement is a spirit of harmony and a willingness to help one another. And that was something I was willing to put to the test. I recognized its power. I actually quit my day job as a publicist for one of the top real estate agents in Utah at the time and put my faith in this method, went and joined a mastermind group that I was familiar with. And within nine months, I had started three companies, tripled my income and had a lot of great results that came from it. But it wasn't just me. The story is more than just me. It's the people who were in that room. You know, we, we sacrificed to be there and we sacrificed to help one another first before I got served, before I really got my goals worked with and for and supported by other members of this mastermind group, I was also helping other people. And it was a huge sacrifice. It was a huge commitment. And I recognized its power. And so motivational speaker is a generic term for what we do in this trade. But if you were to boil it down, I'm a mastermind, I'm a mastermind methodologist. I take the Napoleon Hill concepts, I expand on them, I travel the world and I teach people on how to use the methodologies in their work in their family life, in their schools, in their businesses, in their boardrooms, even going to the school districts. And I'm working on municipalities and governments as well. And as a result of all that, I hope to take this method that works, it accelerates results and creates answers and solutions for people. That's, that's going to be a pretty big thing. And I can use those principles to help professionals, to help athletes, to help individuals, you know, achieve high performance in their own life, whether it's a small goal, a big goal, a medium goal, or, or just developing the right habits to achieve their goals. So that's me in a nutshell. Uh, I hope I summed all of that up and I'm sure it sparked lots of other questions, but I definitely care about the work I do because I found that it is one of the most accelerated forms of, of success for individuals who seek it. Any book by Napoleon Hill is going to be a good read. There's only a few that I think people might not resonate with because it's going to be just like his opinion. But the ones like Think and Grow Rich are really thought invoking. So I encourage anyone, if they haven't read that book already, to grab it, read it, and love it because you're going to learn so much about yourself in that book. Now, we do bring that mastermind in chapter 10 together where two minds can create a mastermind. But what would happen if you had two bad voices? Would that create a good voice or better off alone with just one good voice. Science says, you know, two negatives equal a positive, right? You know, my answer to that is it depends. And I know that's not a great answer. For me, it's all about where your desire is. And Napoleon Hill talks about this. In fact, I wrote, um, I, I contributed to a celebrity book series called The 13 Steps to Riches. And it's a 13 volume series where we dive into each of the steps to riches that Napoleon Hill talks about. And the first one is called Desire. And whatever you desire, 
is what you're going to journey towards. And if it's two negative minds that come together that can create a positive result, sure. I mean, the word mastermind in modern day terms can be conceived as a uh, a criminal mastermind where two negatives planning to rob a bank can come up with a positive result by having the money, right? But at the same time too, it's what they're actually doing is they're combining teamwork, camaraderie, the ability to come up with great solutions. And they're using these principles. There's an old African proverb that I I love and adore and respect, and it's come so true in my life. And it's, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. That principle ultimately describes what Zig Ziglar was trying to teach us as a result of his experience in what he learned through service, sales, leadership, and this mastermind method, which is you can truly have anything you want in this life if you help enough people get what they want first. Serve people first, dive into it. So yes, you can take two minds that are negative and create a positive outcome for them or for others, who knows? I tend to not focus on whether it's positive or negative, but what it is, is is if it matches your desire. And Napoleon Hill talks really in-depthly about about creating your own desire statement, which really is the formula for creating high performance or keys to success. And whatever that is for you, it is a culmination of repetition, focus, desire, and continuing to decide what it is that you'd like to do. You you, you tap into various mother nature's uh, greatest powers within ourselves, such as faith, hope, auto-suggestion, persistence, decision-making, and so much more. You tap into other things like the subconscious mind, the brain, and we even get into concepts like the sixth sense. But one of my favorite powers of them all is one called transmutation. Now, Napoleon Hill refers to a power called sex transmutation, which takes one energy and converts it to another. And I have actually experienced this transmutative power as an athlete converting my athleticism into a new energy, which is entrepreneurship, leadership, and my voice. And it's the exact same power, it's the exact same method, and it's a really, really powerful process. Take it like this. If I want to run 100 meters, the fastest way to get to the end of the 100 meter dash is to sprint it all out, everything on the track. You got to give it your all. But if you decide to walk it, it could take you up to three or four minutes to finish it. Just because 100 meters is not what most people are used to walking. And if you think too much about it, or if you think, you know, I'll get there when I get there, then you're not going to be satisfied with the results as well as the process. But anytime anyone hears the gun go off and they're sprinting down that 100 meter lane and they come across the finish line, there's a sense of accomplishment. And so when it comes to high performance, achieving goals, any type of success, and I hate using that word because it's so overused in anyone's space. Like everyone wants to achieve success. Well, success is defined by the individual. But when you have that accomplishment of I did something hard or I did something difficult in a much faster way than I expected, there is this overwhelming physical and spiritual and mental experience that says, wow, I achieved something. And I think that that's an approach worth diving into. We have a, a percent, right? I think it's like 2% of the world achieve wild success. And then everyone else is kind of just makes it, or maybe it's like around 50K or around average. Maybe some are poverty line, maybe some are a little bit above that, just trying to reach that 10%. But we have that notion of we can either sprint and achieve great success, or we can just walk our way and we're going to make it in three to four minutes, right? We still have success, right? Again, success is going to be individualized to the person. So success for one person might be just getting over that finish line versus I want to be first. There's just going to be different mindsets. Why do you think that there's going to be people who want to be first and then people who just want to finish the race? Do you think that's a cultural thing or just maybe they're lazy? I th- You know, I lo- again, I love these questions. Michael, you should get an award for great uh, provocative and also like thought provoking questions. Cause I love how below the surface we go with this. I definitely believe that when you know what you know, it's rewarding enough, but what you don't know creates ambiguity and also question, but also there's no rush. I mean, think about this. The, I talked about transmutative power when you're sitting on the couch, having been watching Netflix for a couple hours, and then all of a sudden you get a phone call and let's say it's your mom and she's bringing over the whole family. 
And she says, you know, I'll be there in 15 minutes. All of a sudden you're like, I got to get out of my underwear. I got to pick up the popcorn I spilled. I got to do the dishes. I got to vacuum. I got to clean this house. There's no doubt in my mind that when someone turns that transmutative power on, that they can clean the entire house in 15 minutes before mom gets there. That is something that I think everyone takes for granted because you have the ability to turn that switch on and have full sprint capabilities and get there first. And when you do that, you will have a sense of accomplishment. You'll recognize that, wow, I can do things in a very, very short amount of time, which rewards me with more Netflix time or more other things, right? And so my answer to the question, I guess, would be when you recognize that you have the ability to do things a lot quicker, you will most likely want to do them more often quicker because then you can achieve more things. The core values, and I guess like the drivers of humanity, you know, there's there's quite a few, but if you really boiled it down, the majority of people, you mentioned community or culture, the majority of people thrive off of validation. And the validation comes from community support and so much more. The other drivers, uh, you know, include, you know, principles of what Napoleon Hill described in, in his desire statement. And I just feel like when you have that sense of accomplishment, you recognize within yourself that you are able to do things faster than you thought you could. And when, when you desire, truly desire something, then it's worth pursuing. But that's the problem with today is when people set goals, they truly don't desire what they want. They just think about it and think, oh, that sounds really good to me. And you talk about like New Year's resolutions. There's a reason why 99% of them fail. I don't know if that's the right statistic, but the majority of them fail because most people, most people don't sprint towards their goal and, and it's not truly what they desire. But if you desire something, I mean, literally you will feel like a Viking going to war where they burned the ships behind them. There is no plan B. There is no option for cowardly retreat. When you have a desire, nothing stops you from what you want to do. So whether you walk it or sprint it, it's up to you, but there is no plan B. And I think that that just is something that resonates with most, because if you truly do want to achieve a goal, you're going to find a way to do it. In 15 minutes, you can clean the whole house. In 90 days, you can make $5,000 extra on top of what you already do. You can start a business. You can grow anything. You can build something that is going to last and be absolutely rewarding in the long run. And it all starts with your desire. We have started to live in a sense of comfort. We want to be comfortable. I'm sure you're familiar with the comfort zone, the fear zone, the growth zone, and the success zone, right? We have all those different zones. And a lot of people like to stay in the comfort zone because they're too afraid to go past the fear zone. Sometimes we need a little bit of motivation. Sometimes we need to push uh, like a trauma. Those are very effective. Uh, I have uh, a lot of people who come to me with traumas. They don't take action when everything is going good in their life. Everything is just going okay. Things are good enough. And so they don't take any action. But when you know they're in boiling water and they're like, uh-oh, I got to make some changes, that's when they're like, I need some help. Why do you think people wait until the last minute rather than taking the initiative and going for that success in that growth zone? I don't want to beat a drum that I've already beat, but if you truly desire what it is that you want, nothing, nothing waits right? Uh, I, I feel like most people most people are familiar with long-term goals. We're often asked the question at work, you know, where do you see yourself in 10 years or 15 years, or whatever? And that's a hard question to ask because, you know, most of us can't even see where we're going to be in a week. Most of us can't even see where we're going to be in a couple of days. And so why do people wait? And I think it's because they haven't picked or they haven't discovered or they haven't gotten clarity on the goals and the aspirations that they truly desire. If they found something that was worth pursuing, look, when I, when I know that my favorite dish is in the refrigerator upstairs and, I, and I'm really excited about it, it's not lunchtime yet, but I could have it now. Man, that food is good enough. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to head straight to that refrigerator, open it up, make my food and, and, and enjoy it. And when I can have that, when I have that satisfaction, then I get what I want. And I don't think people want enough. I don't think they understand what they want. You've got to work towards things that you want. And it's hard to say that and describe that without people being like, of course, I, you know, I want a million dollars. You know, I want a huge estate. I want, 
to travel the world and live off of, you know, YouTube dollars and, and have sponsorships and stuff? Of course you do. But how bad do you want it? Because if you're not working on it now, if you're not building that absolutely right now, then do you really want it? We use a term called obsessed and obsessions can be a good thing. A lot of people spin obsessions in a negative light, just like they would mastermind in a negative light, because it seems as though an obsession is something you you work towards at the cost of everyone around you. And essentially, if you can build positive or even happy or healthy obsessions, then you truly want something, you go for it. And sometimes we don't stop. I used to, when I, when I pivoted into entrepreneurship, I still had my athleticism in me. And I did these 200 mile relay races. Um, some people know them as Ragnars. Um, at the time they were, it was called the uh, Grand Teton Relay. We'd run through the Teton Mountains, 200 miles past the baton off. And, you know, as an athlete and as a sprinter, I had never run more than like five or six miles in one day, let alone, you know, a marathon or more. It was something that where I knew I was going to finish, but I just didn't know how long or what it took. And every time I'd step onto the road to go run my leg or whatever my route was, I had run more than I had ever done before. But what was my desire? I wanted to finish. I wasn't going to disappoint myself and say, hey, I'm just going to sit in the van for the rest of the trip and let the guys and the gals run the rest of the race for me. No, I was going to contribute. And I committed to myself. I committed to that. Anyone who's signed up for a 5K, a walkathon, or even like a half or a full marathon, they know this. They're not planning on failing. They're planning on finishing. And so they just move in that direction. And it's the same concept. It's called transmutative power. You put one energy, which are the, whether it's a spiritual energy, a cognitive energy, a physical energy, or different, and you put that into the achievement of one thing, that's where it comes from. So why would people hesitate? You've got to find obsessions, healthy obsessions worth fighting for. And whether you finish them in 15 minutes or 15 years, at least you're working towards something worthwhile. Super cliche, but I love it. You know, Edison didn't fail whatever hundred times in making the light bulb. He just found how many thousand ways that a light bulb didn't work. And that was his perspective, but he never stopped trying. When it comes to failure, they just have that bad taste in their mouth because, you know, like growing up, if you get an F on a test, it means you failed. And it can mean many different things. You're dumb. You're not good enough. You have to go home and get assigned by your parents. And your parents are like, why do you not study? You can't play video games. So there's so many punishments along with a failure. So when we have real life failures that we can go for that are going to lead to big successes later on in life when we're adults, we just have that ouch, I got burned when I touched the stove type of mentality. A failure is not that. A failure is a stepping stone for your success. How many stepping stones do you need to reach the top? This could be different for everyone. Some people are going to get it on the first step. Some might need a thousand. No matter the journey that you're on, you have to just keep on pushing. You have to remain resilient. And that is what separates the high achievers to the people who just kind of accept whatever happens, right? You can run your sprint in 30 seconds, or you can do it in four minutes. It's up to you. How do you want to live your life? And for the people who are going to live in fear, that's how you're living your life. But you do have to learn how to get out of that fear and more into if you get a failure, what do you do about it? What is something you do, John, when you fail? Do you just say, oh, well, I failed, try again? Or, oh, man, that sucked. You know, I'm going to take a break a little bit. What's that type of mindset that you have when it comes to failure? You know, I, I interview and listen to and observe so many great athletes, great business owners, and, and I learn from successes. But, you know, as much shelf education as I do by observation and by reading, nothing is sweeter and nothing is better than failure because it is the fastest course correction that can be added to anyone's process. You know, I'm only 33 years old. I've started multiple businesses. I've failed in so many ways. I've made every entrepreneurial mistake you can think of. What motivates me is most people would say, wow, John, I can't believe you're still got the energy and the spirit in you. Like you've gone through these things from every disaster to, to that. But it's, it truly is an addictive quality to find success. It totally outweighs all of the failures. But the failures 
our our way of of feedback, right? If you were a scientist and the petri dish in front of you is your experiment and every little thing that goes into it, you just rinse and repeat and try new things and it gives me a lot more motivation. I think that it is also an attitude thing. I think that you've got to build a muscle and a habit for a good attitude. If you don't have a good attitude and perspective on things, it's going to be a lot more difficult for anybody to relish in in failures and to take them as examples. I'll give you a couple methods that I use when I do fail because they are disappointing. It's not like I smile every time I fail. I'm like, wow, (laughs) here's another learning perspective. Like, I don't think that right away. Although I do lead to the silver lining, I do try to sit in that moment because there's one thing that we also do in this modern world. And I'm so grateful for coaches, mentors, therapists, clinical, psychological leaders, because there is a power to feeling our emotions. Your emotions are validating. They're very important. And when experienced, they can teach you a thing or two. But one of the things that I first do is when I fail, I'm a spiritual person, so I'll give gratitude. As painful as it is, I'll give gratitude, whether I'm sobbing, (laughs) whether I'm in pain, or whether I'm just feeling so stupid in that moment, I'll give gratitude for it. The second thing I do is I write it down. Because if I know and I put it to words or put it to commandments, essentially, that what I failed or what I did, then I can always use that as a reference. Because when I get back on the track and I come to this crossroad again, I know that that didn't work and I got to pivot and I can use my assertive powers or I can use my intellectual thoughts to decide to create a new path. And um, that's what trailblazers do. And we're all trailblazers. I love analogies. And as as a trailblazer or a hiker, sometimes the trail isn't as clear or you don't quite remember every single turn along the way. But every time you trust your intuition and you focus on that process, man, you'll be proud of, of the failures. And again, like betting in Vegas, that one hit of success outweighs a thousand failures and it's worth it. You got to you got to develop the habit of good attitude. You've got to decide, you know, am I okay with this? Can I go through with it? And can I rinse and repeat and work towards a better outcome? And getting comfortable with that type of rejection is hard for most, but it is doable, and if you can do it, then you'll find yourself leaps and bounds ahead of where you thought you were before. Success and the competition aspect is It's something I often think about, right? Because if we think about competition, right? I want to be first place. I want to be the winner. I want to achieve great things. But then you have someone who labels success as, well, I just want to finish the race, right? I'm sure you probably saw the, it's like a meme or like a picture of like the person who won first place and the person who won third place and the third place guy is all happy and cheerful. And the first place, the guy is like, wait, what's going on? I won. So it's like, you should be sad that you didn't win. I won. But then the guy who's first place is kind of confused. So it's a mindset there because we can get third place and we can still say, well, we did what we wanted to, right? Our success. But then we have that competition type of mentality, right? Where people are very competitive in nature, where they want to be number one. They want to be the top dog. And they're like, all right, anyone in front of me, I'm going to defeat them. If there's another company, I'm going to destroy them. You want to be the top podcast or the top realtor in your in your state. I mean, there's just so many different number one positions available and everyone wants that number one spot, but some people might not have that competitor-esque type nature. Do you think you have to have that type of nature in order to be successful? Or do you believe that you could be successful without being that type of competitor? Mm. Oh man, I love this. I don't think you have to have the competitive fire within you to achieve success. One of my favorite books is Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. When you read Outliers, you understand the concept of repetition, putting in the time, understanding the achievement, and working towards an undefined future. Meaning you may know what you're working towards, but you do it anyways in hopes that you become the front runner of of anything and, and you create something that will outlive you. Whether it was the Beatles or Bill Gates' story, or you know, even the hockey players who rise above any other player in the league. And I think it's fascinating too, because we do need some sort of competitive fire 
to battle our own failures and battle our own selves when it comes to success and achievement. But when it comes to beating other people or being first place, I I think it's interesting. At this point in my life, had I been on the podium, I would have been that third place guy screaming super proudly of my accomplishment over the achievement of number one, because it really is a huge accomplishment. But let's just say that you have that edge. Another great book that describes the Kobe Bryant experience. There are people called cleaners and cleaners are those who just, they're the anomalies, but they have the cutting edge. In their mind, competition and winning is the only option. And there's a very, very select few of people who actually have cleaner mentality and cleaner qualities. And these are the types of people who unhealthily, I don't even know that's a word, to <laughs> go beyond the, the recommended prescription of their diet or of their workout scheme or whatever it is to achieve what they want, and they sacrifice. What I think I believe is that you do need to be competitive as long as it's competitive in achieving new results, because that creates that desire, that obsession, and that constant yearning for repetition in order to achieve what you want. But as far as like competition towards others, yeah, there's there's a balance. You truly have to sacrifice if you want to be number one. And if that's your goal, all power to you. And we will all salute you. We all love a good story of somebody who who makes it to the top. It's interesting too. You were mentioning this earlier. LeBron James just broke the all-time NBA scoring record. And he is literally the all-time greatest scorer in NBA basketball history. And, And it's interesting because he's been in the league for about 20 years now. For those of you who like just know the name LeBron James, All of a sudden, it's like the blink of an eye, an entire career, 20 years of playing just slips before your eyes. And here he is achieving this great thing. You don't see the hours, the dedication, the sacrifice, the things he goes through in order to have done all of that. We don't see that. We don't see the behind the scenes, the therapy that he goes to, to have his body maintain that particular achievement. And so there is a cost and positive or negative, it's yours. It's all up to you. So if you decide that that's what you want, number one, go for it. You know, if you decide that just winning is good enough, go for it. But you've got to decide whether it's the innate competition within yourself or the innate competition to beat others, use it for good and use it to get where you want to go. And just recognize that everything has a cost and there's a sacrifice to exchange and obtaining what it is that you're working towards. So. It's a little bit of an obscure answer, but I think that competition is healthy. Just got to balance it with whatever it is that you're working towards. Well, let's go on the basketball combo then. We have the big three, right? Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, and LeBron James. What would you rank them in order of the most competitive, I guess you can say? Not about achievements, because of course, Michael retired, you know, you know, Kobe RIP, but it's like... LeBron wanted that like he wanted to be the number one scorer he wanted to be this player versus Michael was like I did what I had to do Kobe is like I did what I had to do LeBron is like well I want to beat everyone so it's kind of like well I beat everyone I got the badge of honor but when we look at those three LeBron is like a little kid compared to these two giants right what's your ranking despite unpopular belief right uh this 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 conversation and this argument will go down in history as the most undecided thought but, you know, if you're asking my opinion and my ranking, I've done a lot of research and, and, and learning more about these athletes. And if you would have asked me two years ago or three years ago, I would have said Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. But today that has changed. Um, obviously, we don't have Kobe today living with us to, uh, to sort of measure this. And so his, his journey did have an end or a stop, unfortunately. But at this point right now, I would rank LeBron, Michael, then Kobe, because I, as an observer of success and as a student of watching athletes and business successes and converting that into coaching and so much more, I recognize that there's something that LeBron has done that the other guys didn't. And that was, I mean, they all started young, very, very young. And what he has done is that he's taking care of his body, but also his mind in the process. And in the interview last week, when he was talking about, you know, you know, this is really, really a huge achievement. I'm so excited. 
he talked about how he may have five to even seven plus more years in him, which means if that's how his body is holding up, then he has made that plan. He's definitely come up with a solution to be one of the best, to score at high levels, and also to win championships. It's above all incredible. But aside from the physical stuff is the mental stuff. Again, I'll probably get lots of hate mail for this, and that's cool. It's just an opinion, you guys. But you guys don't recognize that out of the millions of dollars he earns each year, he invests several million dollars into his mindset, into his personal brain mentality and his attitude. There's so much more that goes into him than just body, muscle, scoring, basketball, and more. There's strategy. There's understanding. There's being able to cope with hate, being able to to know that there are people out there that would egg him. And that is huge because... You could be number one and still conservatively focus on your path, your goals, and still have a life. And I think that whatever it is, uh, work-life balance, if that exists, the man talked about his family, his kids. And if there's something I've noticed with LeBron is not only is he an animal on the court, but he is so good off the court, whether it's with his children, his family, his wife, his community. And um, so, yeah, I think all of that is a, is a perspective for me. And yeah, I watched a few games as a kid of Michael Jordan. I can't deny his greatness, but I'm just thinking if you take all of the realms, there's so much more to that. And I think there's so much that we can learn and apply from that too. You can competitively work towards becoming number one in something. Great. Do it. If that's what you want, go for it. But if you actually sit back and plan it out, work with coaches, mentors, and you study the process of which you're working towards and find better not conservative, but better, more intuitive, as well as uh, where I want to look for is like futuristic. Like if you look for new ways, new competitive ways to grow without damage, then that's what it's all about. I mean, NASA is a great example of this. As we strive to build more and more rockets that can sustain travel through space, there are so many new technologies coming out that will make the process easier, faster, more informational and will keep us safe. Um, Back in the day when we were launching people into space, it was not a guarantee if you would come back. Um, Nowadays, the percentage is higher. And that comes from an evolution of self, an evolution of technology, and an evolution of perspective. And you don't see us stepping on the moon every single day anymore because it's perspective. We don't need to. We've got other missions, other things we're studying, and other perspectives around us. So it, it really is an interesting conversation and topic, but I definitely decided for myself, put it out there. Uh, I'd go, I go LB. When we look at those three achievers, we're just looking at their competitive nature, of course, but then also their high performance nature too. And I know you do some work with high performance and you have four laws or four secrets that you can share with us that are going to help people understand, well, how to be a high performer, because those three men are high performers. If you can, what are your four secrets to high performance? Super simple, because success isn't easy. It is simple. And what I have found in all my years of athleticism, business, and public speaking as a young entrepreneur, there's four things that have truly given me not only the power to succeed, but the accelerated power to exceed. Because again, if I'm going to do something, I'm not going to wait 20 years to do it. Uh, that's Unfortunately, that's why I jumped off the corporate ship. I didn't want to work a 10-year job to gain the respect that I needed in order to get the salary and get paid at what I want. Now, I don't knock on anyone. I'm just that way. And call it ADHD or call it entrepreneurial fire, I don't know. But I've learned over the last you know 10 years There are four qualities, four principles, and four secrets to success that really help accelerate that process for everybody. And they all fall within the realm of accountability. I've learned the power of accountability is extremely, extremely important. So number one, just like like Napoleon Hill describes in Think and Grow Rich, your desire, but your own personal accountability is number one. If you can't have that desire, that obsessive component, of what it is that you want to achieve, then you're going to you're going to find yourself not achieving a lot of things or falling short every single time because it isn't worth it isn't worth it to you to finish. And you know, 
people would argue, right? They'd say, well, there are people who achieve greatness all the time who regret it because they don't know what they're working towards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop focusing on the anomalies and start focusing on the proven track record of most success. So personal accountability is number one. What do I mean by that? It means you've got to learn what integrity is for yourself. Most people know the definition of integrity as, you know, what you do when no one's looking, but there's always someone looking. You're looking, you're looking within, you're looking outward. So what do you do with yourself? The the best example of this is when the alarm clock goes off in the morning, do you get up or do you hit snooze? Where is your level of integrity within yourself and what it is you want to desire? You know, by getting up by 5 a.m., getting to the gym, having your routine and getting into everything you need will get you on that path to your success. Then your personal integrity is, is how willing and how excited or how are you willing to fight in order to achieve that? That's personal integrity and your personal accountability. That's the first one. The second one is having a buddy. (laughs) It sounds really silly, but you really do need a buddy in the system. And we talk about that power of mastermind. You know, two minds can create a positive outcome, whether they're negative or positive, right? And so when you have a buddy who checks in with you, but I, I call it the accountability partner because the accountability partner is not just someone who's gonna say, ah, you slept in this morning? Well, let's get them next time. Rather than that, it's gonna be like, you slept in this morning? Do you recognize that by sleeping in, it's costing you this? And it's going to not help you get there faster. Somebody who believes in your goal as much as you believe in it. And you always want someone who, who truly believes in you more than you believe in yourself. Because sometimes you need that extra umph to get up the hill when you need it. So an accountability partner, it's the second power and success and secret to achieving your goals at high performance. The third, the third one is that you need not only an accountability partner, but you need a plan. And the best plans come from coaches, you know, like yourself, Michael, or for for anyone who can lead and help you, whether it's a clinical coach, a a psychiatrist, a mentor, a motivational speaker, if you you will, um, or an example of, of a mentor, right? Somebody you can read about, not necessarily have to talk to. You, most people think mentorship is like a Mr. Miyagi and apprentice, right? But that's not, that's not the only way. You don't need that person directly in your life to achieve great things. You can get it from a book. You can get it from an idea or you can get it from a belief about an idea. So you truly need to get into the realm of coaching. And I recommend you do your work. You do your shopping. You trust in people who resonate with you, but don't just shop with who you feel good about. Shop with who's going to stretch you. Um, I'm a very nice person. I have that competitive nature when it comes to athletics, but in my conversation, I don't swear. I'm not, I'm not a crude person. I just like to make people smile and have my day. I love having mentors who challenge that, who come with this competitive nature and challenge everything that I believe because they give me that extra edge in what I'm working towards. And that's how at a young age, I've done more than most people. And so that's one of the most powerful principles. And then finally, the fourth key to success or accelerated law for performance is that mastermind concept. You need a community, okay? LeBron didn't make all, I can't quote it, but 4,000 plus points over the last 20 years. I think it's 6,000, but I can't remember. Whatever he did, he didn't do that alone. Someone had to pass him the ball. So when you want to achieve something great, you need to surround yourself with great people. It's about time. You've been thinking about it at night. You've been kicking yourself because, you know, you've been friends with these people for forever. But it's time that you surround yourself with winners. And that's nothing negative. It's nothing to say about who you hang out with. It's just, it's time that you surround yourself. So take a look at your work environment. That's where we spend most of our time. Your work environment, if it's positive, great. If you feel like the people around you are inspiring you to take action, you're in the right place. You've known this for a very, very long time, but you decided, nah, I'm not going to push the needle on this. Then you've been enabling yourself to live in an environment that's not key to your success. You need people around you, whether it's one person or many, but your community is vital. And I call it the mastermind concept. You can go and attend a mastermind group, which is an accelerated organizational form to achieving that success, or you can start to eliminate the people in your lives who are negative forces and only focus on positive forces. I met a lady named Judy Robinette. She wrote a book called um, How to Be a Power Connector. 
and she had a formula for her friends. And it was really interesting to me because it's like, I'm not going to pick my top five friends and then pick my top 10 and then the next tier and the next tier. It had a lasting impression on me because she absolutely manages the most important people in her life based on the success that she wants to achieve. And she's done it and she's revered for it. She's one of the richest women in Idaho and one of the top business investors in Utah. And she's renowned for her concepts and what she does. And most people don't know her as the power connector. Most people know her as the person who has made calculated risks in order to achieve high performance and success. And I really, really respect it. So uh, I'll do a real quick repeat and just sum up of what I just shared. The four keys to success and what I call high performance habits or high performance values is personal accountability and integrity. Once you have that, you're on the track to success. Number two is you need an accountability partner, someone who believes in your success just as much or if not greater than you already do. Number three is that you need a coach. You need someone who can calculate it, who can give you the plan, who can scream in your face when they need to, and can high five you when you either fail or achieve. And then the fourth and final concept that you need in order to achieve high performance is a community, whether it's a mastermind group or a mastermind community of people who are absolutely there to give you what you need to get you where you need to go. And those four qualities are accelerated powers. When you even turn the dial on one, you achieve greater success in in leaps and bounds, but also high percentages. And if you really split them up into quarters, it puts you faster on track to achieving what it is that you want. I've seen this in business. I've seen this as an athletic coach. I've seen it as, as an athlete. I've seen this in spiritual growth as well. And I've seen this in, in intellectual concepts. The one part I haven't seen it succeed in, and I'm working towards this, but there's a lot more red tape than I understood, um, is government and politics. And I'm working on that too. But it essentially has proven track record if you use them in combination and you work towards your ultimate goals and success and desires. Yeah, community is going to be important for anyone's success. We just have to understand that we don't live in this world alone, right? There's so many people we interact with in a day and you might not interact with them personally. For example, you go to the grocery store, you didn't grow those apples, you didn't get those bananas, you didn't milk that cow, but yet you have it because someone wanted you to have that, right? And then we do have our trade system where we give money for the goods. So we need people in order to be the people we are today. The people we can be tomorrow is also essential that we have the right people in our life. So do some self-reflection, understand who do you have in your life. And if you don't have someone who is going to be promoting your cause or helping you along that way, in some aspect, it doesn't have to be monetary. It could just be, I'm here to support you. I'm here to say good job. I'm here to give you that high five. You fall over. I'm here to give you that hand up. That's so important to have. And I think sometimes people, they give other people the out. Well, you know, they might not be able to afford your book or they might not be able to afford your services. I completely understand. But a like doesn't cost anything. A follow doesn't cost anything. So understand who's following you. Understand who is around you. And then if they're not conducive to your goal for the future, put them in a different bracket. They might be holiday buddies where you only see them around the holidays. There's nothing wrong with that. You could choose your circle and make sure you choose the right one. John, you know, you and I could talk about motivation, success, high performance all day. It's so important for people to understand. In our last couple of minutes, can you please tell us any last words and tell the audience where they can find you? Absolutely. And Michael, thank you for your time too. I love the questions and how they elicit, you know, a conversation of deeper knowledge rather than the surface. And I think with a lot of podcasts out there, too many people are sitting at the surface. Michael, your podcast truly gets beneath that and helps really, really motivate and inspire through knowledge and understanding. You can reach me anywhere on social media. Uh, My handle is at sign John Kovach Jr. It's J-O-N-K-O-V as in Victor, A-C-H-J-R. I do take and answer personal invites to to messages. I have a team that manages my social media, but as far as it comes to connections, conversations, and relationships, I answer all of those. But if you want to send an email because you have a question or you want to learn more or just find out where I'm speaking next, you can send an email to john at mychampioncircle.com. I focus on working on the champion mindsets everywhere I go. And uh, whether it's a quote or a, a conversation, or even just a high five, I'm I'm all for it. And so those are the two best ways, social media, and I have an email as well. 
Perfect. And I will put those links and all of your socials and the email in the description box below so people can easily just go down there, send you an email, follow you and see where you're going to speak next. Because the work that you do is important for people to understand and then to commit to because if we can commit to a better self, if we can commit to a better future, then we're going to be on the right path to our success. And we can do it in 30 seconds, not four minutes. I want to thank you so much, John, for coming on Coaching in Session. Great conversation today. Thank you, Michael.